I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my daily life living in Nicaragua. Today, I have a really long form question that I think digs into a lot of complicated topics. And honestly, I haven't actually read all of it yet, but we're going to dig into this from a longtime viewer who is, I think, from what I've glanced at, this is layer after layer of, of different things that we talk about here on the channel, but all of them coming together in a single question where I think, and, and I really want people to, to dig in and watch this video because I know we're going to be unraveling a bunch of things that independently I think are relatively complex. And when you and, and this is weird to talk about with relocation, but when we're talking about jobs and, and investing in relocation and moving to a new country and changing our lives like this, there's actually a bunch of moving pieces that often are things, very often are things that most people have never encountered before and very rarely think about in normal life. And when you put them all together, each of these little pieces that are complicated on their own, watch our videos on, for example, residency or why you don't want a job or uh, how to get uh, visas or whatever, right? And you start putting these all together and it becomes increasingly complex. Each one typically has many videos digging into why it works the way it does, how to do it, how it works for you. And uh, the recent vaccine requirements is a great example where people are reacting to one thing and don't realize they're misunderstanding something else that makes this thing not mean what they think it does. And I think this is going to be a topic where we're going to dig into some really serious details that get really into a, well, this because of this, because of this, and, and explain what's going on. Because the questions that I think uh, Raku has here are going to apply to a lot of people. And I think we're going to dig into a lot of things that answer, uh, that put together a lot for a lot of people. So let's hit that bump and get right into it. Okay, so before we get started, there's a couple things that I want to preface with. One is we, so some people uh, additionally asked questions about this and, and they had already prompted uh, the video that came out just two days ago. If you haven't seen that, one of the things that led to this question, I think, and I think it was on this, was <clears throat> the question of, uh, can I come to Nicaragua and be a doctor? And in the very specific case that was being asked, of course, being a doctor, there, there could be complicated licensing things. I can't really answer that specific for you. The person who was asking was actually a Nicaraguan who just isn't living in the country right now. So he absolutely could legally come to the country and become a doctor. The reason I made the you don't want to work in Nicaragua video was in a hopes of explaining that no matter what your situation is, with the assumption you're coming from one of the wealthy countries, US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, something like that, that no matter what you are imagining, no matter what the rules are, no matter what anything else is, if you are aware of the factors, then you won't want to work in Nicaragua, period. If you have the feeling that you want to work in Nicaragua, other than donating your time. You want to donate, you want to be a volunteer, that is a different thing. That's We don't really consider that working, but you could, so I understand why that would be, but, but can I do that? Of course. But if you want to work for the intention of work, right, which is to make an income and you're from any of those countries, then you don't want to work in Nicaragua. If you think you do, there must be a misunderstanding of how to make money or the goals of working. Right, because whatever you're imagining, it must be wrong. So there must be something in the layer, the onion of the Nicaraguan experience must be being missed. And so that's why we're digging into this. And there's a lot more to this, right? So this really applies to everyone. So I want people to be aware. This is for, this is targeted. We're gonna have this context. We're assuming the group of people that we refer to as expats, uh, no, I'm not saying that's correct. I'm not saying we should, but the, what people refer to as expats. You're coming from one of the wealthy countries and you're coming to Nicaragua voluntarily. You are not an asylum seeker. You're not a refugee. I realize a lot of Canadians are now starting to think of themselves as refugees. At this time, you are not a refugee. You are an affluent, uh, uh, migratory person looking to take advantage of international arbitrage, whether it's life arbitrage, income arbitrage, whatever. That's that's where you fall in this category. If you're a Venezuelan refugee, if you are uh, the person on my channel who's coming from Libya, I understand those are different situations. You may be coming from a place that has uh, extreme income challenges and you may need work when you get to Nicaragua. That is a, that is a different situation. There you're gonna have to deal with legalities, not once, but I wanna have that context. Also, very important context. Nicaragua is a sovereign country. Everyone who's coming here, 
is doing so by the grace of the government allowing you. And this is the same with every country. This is not unique to Nicaragua. We could say the same thing about Costa Rica, same thing about the United States, same thing about Germany, it doesn't matter. But it's an important thing to remember because many people coming here are coming from like the United States or Europe where they're used to having a certain amount of rights when crossing borders. That is not the case here. This is a fully sovereign country. And when we're here, we have to operate within a few guidelines, right? One is we have to operate within the law. And two, ethically, we are here to add benefit to the country. And countries like Nicaragua and the United States, right, this is what governments are supposed to do, evaluate the, the ability of someone to come into the country based on their providing value to the country. They are, it is not their job to just allow people in. You have to provide a value. This is why there are uh, certain residency requirements. It's why they do border runs. They check those things at the border. But they know, for example, if you're not working in the country, then you're spending money in the country that wasn't earned here. So you must be providing some amount of financial benefit. If you are doing something else, right, they can prove your income through a different channel and you must be providing. And they could get it wrong. Right, they, but they're, they're looking for the 99.99% cases. Yeah, one every t out of every 10,000 people is gonna slip through the cracks and not be beneficial to the country. They know that there can be mistakes, but the goal, their whole process, is to try to make sure that you are a positive impact, maybe a tiny one, maybe a giant one, on the populace of Nicaragua, because that is the sole job of a government is to ensure that good things are happening for its populace. So that is what they're looking to do. And, and the same, right? If you're in the United States and you have immigrants coming into the United States, the job of US border control and immigration is to allow in people who are going to have a positive impact and to attempt to keep out people that they believe will have a negative impact. Now, you can argue whether they're doing that or not. That is a separate discussion. But that is the, the conceptual role of a government agency in that spot. So with that context, I want to go into this question because I think we're going to find a ton of great stuff in here. These are, I think, very heartfelt, deep sentiments from long-term viewers who are, I think, struggling to put together a lot of moving pieces. And with, and, and with all these things, right? I come from a technology background. We would often have people who are trying to do a bunch of like risk math and vendor math and market availability and changing prices and changing technology and these really complex equations. This is hopefully not that bad. But we would have these really complex equations and people would say, but this got cheap, therefore, and we'd be like, no, 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 these things change, these things change, these things change. So that's why the, the equation is this really complex thing because there's so many moving pieces, you have to account for them all. Any individual piece doesn't make sense on its own. So with that, Let's dig into the question, and, and this is a really long one. I'm going to put all the text down in the description. And of course, you guys, leave your comments, questions, and everything down there. Like, go down, get involved in this conversation, say hi if nothing else, but definitely ask your questions. There's guidelines in the, the description. If you want to send in a video question, that would be amazing. Please do that as well. I'm, I'm not going to read this in its entirety because it's too much all at once, but it's going to be written down there, and we're just going to go uh, line by line reading this and dig into each piece as we go. So let's jump in. This is from Raku5219. Scott, I appreciate your perspectives and thank you for your efforts with this channel. I am puzzled by a few things in relation to this discussion. Okay, so this is the you don't want to work in Nicaragua discussion. Um, because everywhere I have traveled, I've seen migration and new chapters of life unfolding for those who came from somewhere else. People everywhere have always and will always creatively create work opportunities where they find themselves to meet their basic expenses. This is natural and reasonable. These efforts and contributions have shaped our past, present, future, and insisted on every place being uh, able to adapt and evolve with the movement of humanity over time. Okay, so let's start with this because this is a perspective. If you live in the countries that I talked about, right, given that context, you're in the US, you're in Canada, you're in Western Europe, those places over the last century to two centuries have seen a mass amount of migration into those countries, specifically for jobs. This is an important context. If you're from that part of the world, the idea of migration into those countries is primarily because people have left a place that is uh, high in crime and danger, and so they want to get away from that. They are trying to get away from a lack of income, a lack of jobs, low income, um, something like that, uh, uh, military-controlled jobs, government-controlled jobs, cartel-controlled jobs, etc. cetera, right? Um, my, my wife's family came from Italy, 
when Sicily was going through extreme poverty, right? They came to the United States for jobs. Her family, everyone's family, like all, you know, millions, literally millions of Italians moved to the United States for jobs. Today, there's a mass migration of South and Latin, uh, South and Central Americans into the United States and Canada. Why? Jobs. No one's, almost no one's leaving because of safety. They may say that because it gets them asylum. They're paid to say that. They're encouraged to say that. They're incentivized to make that claim. And for someone, I'm sure it's true, but the vast majority, if you live here in Nicaragua, they're totally safe here. They're in very big danger in the United States. For an immigrant going from Nicaragua to the US, the level of increase in danger, even if they were specific, like, no matter what they claim here, there is no person in Nicaragua in as much danger as every person making the illegal journey from Nicaragua to the United States. And unlikely any person in Nicaragua, there is no barrio in Nicaragua, there is no place in Nicaragua where any group of people is in as much danger of violent crime as nearly every immigrant is who gets to the United States from this region, simply because super poor, disadvantaged, easily targets, uh, lots of racism, um, and, and just in rough positions, right? So the act of doing this, plus the government often persecutes them, often the government themselves are the ones that create problems. So the, no one's moving up, not realistically. No, no noticeable percentage of people are actually moving for safety reasons. They're moving for jobs. And you can say, but there aren't jobs. It doesn't matter if there are jobs. There are actually, but it doesn't matter if there are jobs. People are moving because they are told there are jobs. They are told that here there are no jobs that they can see, right? We're in a job crisis. That is real. Venezuela, likewise, is in a job crisis. Argentina is in a currency crisis that essentially creates a job crisis. All these things are true. So there is a problem that people are looking to solve. The United States and Canada and Western Europe advertise heavily that they have these jobs, high income jobs, easily available to all people. And so whether or not it is true doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that the people without jobs or the people with poor jobs are heavily incentivized to believe that there are amazing jobs waiting for them. And no matter what they do, they will get them. That it is worth any risk to receive those jobs because they're lacking jobs now. So this is what you, your context is. If you're in North America and you look at immigration, the view of immigration is to come for work. If you live in the global south instead of the global north, which essentially no one on my channel does, except for those who are in Nicaragua and are watching this out of interest about their country, the majority of migration is not for jobs. It is in spite of jobs. It is they come for a higher quality of life. They come for a higher quality of food. They come for better weather. No one goes to the United States for weather. It's terrible. And let me tell you, no person in the history of the world has gone to Canada for weather, right? It's probably the number one reason that people leave Canada, even now with everything going on people will continue to cite. The weather's just terrible, right? It is what it is. It's so far north. So people come to the global south for a lot of reasons, but jobs are rarely one of them. There was a time, and there will be times, where that does happen. For example, in the 1950s, my grandfather was offered a job opportunity in Brazil. He didn't take it. I wish he had. That would have been amazing to have grown up in Sao Paulo, but I did not. I grew up in New York instead. But that was a time period where there was massive growth in Brazil, there was opportunities, and in some markets, these things do exist. Brazil is a giant market now. There are opportunities to move to Brazil for work. They are few and far between, but they do exist. It's not that the entire global south has no jobs, but the majority of migration even into Brazil from the global north is not for jobs. It is people who are looking for alternative lifestyles. The jobs are still superior in the north in most cases in the global north. And uh, so when you're, but you're, when you're in a place like Nicaragua where there really are no jobs, there's no jobs available. Like there's just, there just aren't. Every possible role has been filled and has a waiting line to get into it. There is no, like in the United States, you have this context of there is always uh, uh, a job for someone. No matter what career you're in, you may have to move. You may have to take less salary. You may not have to, you get to work for the employer that you really like. There's a lot of potential caveats, but there is always a job available. You want to go into graphic arts? No matter how saturated that field is, there's a way to get a job. You want to be a teacher? No matter how saturated that field is, there's a way to get a job. You want to be a doctor? There's always a job. In Nicaragua, the opposite exists. There is no such thing as a free job in Nicaragua. There may be a job that needs to be filled, and for a moment, they're looking for someone to fill that role. But every single possible role in Nicaragua has a waiting list of Nicaraguans waiting to get into it. Nicaraguans who are already educated, very willing to work, ready to go, 
would step in today, currently out of work, not taking a job away from you. You're not shifting jobs around, you're filling jobs. Right? It's a very, very different market. Because of this, places like the United States and Canada are working, like France, they're looking to lengthen the working week. They're looking to up the retirement age, right? They want to get people working earlier. They need more people in the workforce. So they're encouraging working migration and they're encouraging the existing workforce of natural born citizens to work longer years. Social security is less of a fallback. It used to be that you could expect to retire at 62, then at 65, then at 67. My generation is looking at 70. My children, if they were in the United States, would be looking at 72, 73, right? They have to keep upping the working lifespan because there aren't enough workers and there isn't enough retirement. In Nicaragua, it is very much the opposite. The standard retirement age, this is not a hard and fast rule, but the retirement age is 45, right? Why? Because they want to keep people out of the workforce and let them retire so that other people can take those jobs because there's a shortage of jobs and they need to give the opportunities to new workers. They want to make sure that they're focusing on keeping prime age people working and anyone who's starting to get older that they're encouraged to maybe go watch kids because grandparents watch the kids here so that younger people can go work when they're more energetic. They're more encouraged to go invest in a business. They're not stopped from doing things. They can go open a pulperia. They can go invest in something. They can get in, involved in the arts. They're older. They're wiser. They have more knowledge. They have the opportunity to think for a lifetime of working or a partial lifetime because they're not that old, younger than me is retired. And they go out and they say, well, I have all these interests that I've been not able to do because I've been working all these years. Now I'm gonna be a musician. Now I'm gonna be an artist. Now I'm gonna write a novel. Now I'm going to start a business where I can oversee it using this experience. And I'm not competing because I'm not taking away a job from someone younger who needs it, who needs to put food on the table, needs an opportunity. Uh, so, so Nicaragua, as most of the global south, has an absolutely different context as to what they're looking for from migration and why people are coming here. If you come here and meet the expats, none are here for jobs. That is not the case. You will never find an expat who came to Nicaragua for a job, it, partially because if there was one, they would immediately leave, right? They would say, wow, even though I'm not allowed to work, that's not the problem. It's that I don't want to work here. I didn't realize, and they would instantly go because it doesn't meet their needs. But if you're here uh, and staying, it's because you didn't want to work, right? So you come here and every expat will be like, I never even thought about working here. That's so out of scope. It's so not in, not logical to want to come work here. And so I, I think this very first opening volley of what this question is, is based on this context that in the global north, we perceive immigration as being a thing done to escape uh, a lack of working and a desire to work somewhere else. And I think it's also, if you're an American, for example, or Canadian, we often perceive that people are coming from places with jobs and these jobs are just better. Or they, they're coming from a place that we're told is a terrible place, which is rarely true. Normally they're coming from beautiful safe places or relatively safe places and coming to the US and um, we're told, oh, it's war-torn, it's dangerous, it's blah, blah, blah. The US has to make it seem that way, right? What the US doesn't wanna tell its own citizens and doesn't have to tell its own citizens is that it wants low cost labor to do work Americans don't want to do and aren't doing to prop up the low end of the workforce so that natural born Americans can do higher paid jobs. And in order to do that, they need constant immigrants coming in who are desperate and will take those jobs because they have no other choice. And so the US creates that pressure to bring it up. It works to make it difficult for there to be jobs in other markets, and it makes it fe seem like there's many more jobs in the US than there actually is. Again, what people perceive is all that matters. What reality is doesn't matter. But there are loads of these jobs in the United States. And the United States is never going to make legal immigration that big of a thing. Why? Because in order to keep workers below minimum wage, they must be illegal immigrants. So the United States has engineered a system where, and Canada is likely the same, but the US is extreme in this and is, accounts for the big numbers that most people talk about and witness. They have a system where they depend on illegal immigrants to keep farm work and many other manual labor jobs rolling forward. They need them to be illegal. And so they've created a system where people come to the border believing they will be legal, believing there are jobs, believing a lot of things, and once they fight to get across the border, find out that that is not the case, that they are actually treated 
completely differently, that the rights that they thought they were going to be given don't exist. We hear this all the time in Canada. I assume the same thing is happening there. Uh, it's in the news all the time now that immigrants are getting there and finding out that what they've been told abroad is completely untrue, right? And, and they don't have to be like big ads running on TV. This is governments encouraging people on the street, encouraging, uh, you know, YouTube channels to tell people how great it is. They're encouraging, you know, uh, little tiny news outlets to put out articles about how great someone's had it in the United States. They encourage someone to do an interview somewhere. They encourage a uh, coyote to, to let, you know, let people cross the border. There's a million little, little ways. And that word on the street convinces people that they're going to go up. And living here in Nicaragua, you talk to people all the time. They're like, no, no, no. I'm going to go to the United States. I'm going to pay my, my life savings. I'm going to be rich immediately. I don't, all the things you don't know about the United States, they say to me as an American, it is safe. There are jobs. It is legal. Obviously not true, but they're so convinced because so many people, so many salespeople are selling them on the American dream that now some of them are the coyotes, some of them are human traffickers, some of them are the cartels, but the cartels are openly funded by the United States, right? The CIA funded. This is not a secret. This is not a conspiracy. Congress has investigated. This is actually a thing. This is where a lot of those came from, right? These are American arms of the government in reality, right? Now they may have gone rogue, but these are long stretches of the American government creating this this draw but for very logical reasons as an american if you want to keep eating avocados you need illegal immigrants so you have to uh, realize that the american economy is doing this and so if you ask an immigrant in the united states doesn't matter if it's an irish immigrant during the potato famine right many many generations later italian immigrants during the the unification of italy coming from like sicily for example in the late 1800s early 1900s it doesn't matter if it's nicaraguan and honduran and el salvadoran uh, uh immigrants coming during the 1980s to now right oh in many cases they came up why because the u.s was waging civil war in their country not really civil war right it was an outside war but the united states all through the 80s was at war and the 70s in the war in central america forcing illegal immigrants north because they had nowhere else to go. The U.S. literally came in with military and basically scooped them up and moved them north. They've always been creating a situation. And in many situations, it's just there's no jobs, right? This is not all U.S. created thing other than the advertising that it's a great place to go. And Canada's doing the same thing, right? Go watch uh, Nomad Capitalists. They're talking about how these legacy brand countries have using their marketing power to convince people to go there. And then they find out that it is not what they, they envisioned. But it's too late. They're trapped. They don't have the financial resources to go back home. So, wh so whether you're going way, way, way back, not to the colonial days. That's a little bit different. But post-colonial, when we had major immigration into the United States, including the early German immigrants, right? We were coming because there was a promise of more jobs, better jobs, higher salaries. Those are the early ones. Later on, it was escaping a lack of jobs, escaping famine, escaping war somewhere else, coming and because they needed work. So if you ask anyone, whether they're a current immigrant or a fifth generation uh, immigrant, they're gonna say, my family came here because they needed jobs. That context is super important because when you come here, there is none of that. No one has come here for 150 years looking for work. They may have come here to invest. That's an unrelated thing. We're going to go into that. Um, they may have come here because of the weather. They may have come here because of the, the politics or the, the, the peace that comes from being down here. They may have come for the culture, the food. Any number of things drive people to come to the global south. Jobs is not it. So that perspective that um, these people have always sought these opportunities, yes, but not to places like this, not under situations like this. In world history, countries like Nicaragua would never encourage someone to come for work, completely nonsensical, because you cannot, even if it was legal, you cannot earn enough to make that make sense. That is impossible. There's such a market that makes it so awful to work here. No, if you said this to a Nicaraguan, they would be so confused. How could you possibly have the desire to work here? No Nicaraguan wants to work here. They may want to live here, but no one, there is not one person in this country who wants to work here. And it's not a sensible thing to want. You don't want to work in a place, right? The idea of wanting to work in a specific place um, itself, that should never be a goal. It doesn't matter where it is. United States, Canada, Nicaragua, Russia. Your desire is to do a job to make income. You do it where it makes sense to make that income. You do it from where you want to be. 
but you don't work in where you want to be. You work where it, where the job is available, where you get paid to do the job you want to do, where you find the good job, where the taxes work for you, whatever. That is the sole value in the determination. So goal level thinking is important here. What are your goals when looking at moving to a new country? If your goal is to find new work, well, that's not a reason that you immigrate in that way, right? Not when you're coming from the places that have all the jobs, right? You may immigrate because your job requires it, uh, emigrate because your job requires it, but you don't uh, become an immigrant in this situation in that way, right? It's a, it's a missing goal of the move, right? So that's, that's super important. Okay. To stress how unnatural or unethical doing any work in the country is for a long-term resident who lives in and is part of the Nicaragua community is a little confusing. And I can't imagine the same directive being given to a Nicaraguan or any other immigrant trying to create a new life far from their original home. Okay, so this plays into perfect. That's exactly what I'm talking about. If a Nicaraguan moves to the United States, their value... So uh, let's take it back to a general case because these are specifics that we're deriving. But they're not general. The general is that you always, to be ethical and to do what's right for the country you're going to, because you're the guest, they're the host, for them to allow you in, you have an obligation to be good for their country. A little bit good, really good, but you have an obligation to not be bad, right? And we just had the conversation maybe two weeks ago. Someone said, I want you to make a, a video on what does it take to be a good expat? And that plays into this. I actually want to get shirts that say, be a good expat. That would be awesome. I really, there's a channel, David Manning, that I really like, whose logo is be a good human. And he has these great shirts. I really want to get one, but they're in the States. Um, but be a good expat would be an amazing like thing for this channel. We're going to do that. Okay. But so there's this general case that is crazy important. When someone moves to the United States, the reason that the United States is letting you in almost always, it could be investment. You're a billionaire and you're going to buy a bunch of things. Yes, they're going to let you in. Rich people can always get in anywhere because they're just going to spend so much money that they tend to do good, right? Now, you can have someone who behaves badly, but their nature of the things that they have at their disposal, they're going to do good things for your country. Even the United States wants more billionaires. It just does. So when you're talking about normal migration into the United States, the 99.999% the, the when you get up there is... The thing that you're going to do good for the American people is you're going to provide low cost labor or in some very isolated situations, specialty labor, right? You're providing a labor that the United States cannot provide because the U.S. cannot make enough workers for its workforce, right? And you can't look and say, well, there's, but there's unemployment numbers. Yes, that's because of people shifting jobs, people who don't want to work. There are homeless. There are people with zero job skills in every market who are just useless and there's no way to employ them, unfortunately, right? Th these are just some facts, right? So those numbers are always going to be there and they fluctuate. But at its base level, the United States, even at the worst times, doesn't have enough job, enough workers for all the jobs it needs to do. A lot of jobs just go away because they know they can't fill them so they don't bother. But if you had workers, you would do more things, right? You could farm more food for export if you had more farm workers, as an example. You don't, so it's too costly, so you just, you just shut down those businesses. So to be a good person, to be ethical, moving to the United States normally means that you're going to be a worker and providing a role at a lower cost. And this is part of the law. If you want to take one of those uh, worker visa roles, you must be cheaper than an American worker or fill a role that no American can fill. Those are the rules. Right. And, and so they put into law what the rules are to be ethical in the United States. Of course, if you're super rich and just spending money, absolutely OK. Right. And then there's always someone who falls through the cracks because they didn't catch it. OK. Nicaragua is the opposite. That same thing that would be being a good expat in the United States would be being a bad expat in Nicaragua. You can't work in Nicaragua without taking a job away from a Nicaraguan. And the number one concern of the Nicaraguan government in a non-goal, the goal is to do the good thing for the people. When you distill that into what action does Nicaragua need to take and does take to try to protect its people is it protects their jobs. Right. So like in the United States, their number one goal around immigration is to encourage workers. Nicaragua is to disallow someone who would attempt to take a job. So the very same behavior, if someone is moving to the United States and wants to be good and you are moving to Nicaragua from the global north and you want to be good, they would seek work. You would never seek work. Does that make sense? That goal level thinking automatically explains why it is unethical to try to take work in Nicaragua. You have access to jobs 
in places that need you to work, right? This is not just being good for Nicaragua and bad for the United States. If you move to Nicaragua and work in the United States, in Canada, in Western Europe, you're being good for everyone. Nicaragua is getting good because you are bringing in revenue and assisting in the country and being a good expat. And the United States is doing well because they are getting a worker or not losing a worker that they otherwise would have lost. So it's not just that Nicaragua doesn't want you to work. It's that wherever you're coming from doesn't want you to stop working. So being a good expat or a good emigrant line up in this case. And there's a reason, this is not the underlying reason, but there's a reason that the United States allows a massive, massive tax incentive to do this. And Canada does too, but not quite as easily, but a bigger incentive, but much harder to get. The reason that these incentives exist is because they want you to do it. That's why incentives exist, right? The United States prioritizes you doing this. Now, if everyone did it, they'd change that, but no, not everyone is ever going to do it. It is a tiny number of people who take an interest and, and the, uh, the effort to make this happen. And so as long as that number stays relatively low, then it's not as many people going out and doing this as the United States would like, the government, of course, so they keep the incentive extremely high. You are essentially paid by your governments up north to come to the global south and or other places, but it's essentially the global south, and live there and work remotely. Everybody wins. The global south does better because of it. The global north does better because of it. This is a win-win on a global economic scale. So everybody, Nicaragua is encouraging this, the United States is encouraging this. But if you flip that, and you try to come take a job in Nicaragua and give up your job in the United States, the U.S. will halt its incentives. It's not exactly taking them away, but they no longer apply to you. And Nicaragua will hoist one, simply laws that say you can't do that. But even if they gave you an exemption to the law, which they're allowed to do, then they're going to tax you heavily and penalize you for having done it. So no matter how you approach it, in one case, both countries incentivize, and in the other case, both countries penalize. And both countries can be many countries throughout Latin America and the global south on the one side and many countries across the global north on the other. They regionally tend to act very, very similarly because they have similar needs and desires um, and pressures. All right. So that is the starting point. So the reason that you can't imagine the same directive being given to a Nicaraguan is because the needs of the country are different. And so the equation, though, is the same. If Nicaragua had too many uh, jobs and not enough workers, boom, it would flip instantly. But they don't. And the United States also, if it didn't have enough uh, jobs but had too many workers, it would flip instantly. So that's the reason that they are. So it is a single. They're being treated the same in that you're being expected to be a good ethical expat who's taking into consideration what that means in the place that you're going. It would not be ethical or being a good expat to move to Nicaragua or any place and say what was good for the United States is what I'm going to do here. It's possible that it's the same thing. If you move to Canada, generally what's good for the United States is also good for Canada. They're just very similar in that way most of the time. So that would make sense. And I know a lot of people who've moved between the U.S. and Canada, and people act basically the same uh, as an expat in the other country. No problem, because they have the same needs. And so that gives an impression that maybe all countries are like that, but that is not the case. And this is an extreme example where the United States is almost as far as you can go on one side of what it needs currently, and where Nicaragua is as far as it could be on the other side. And so that is why if you're only looking at the resulting behavior, you get one thing. But if you look at the equation that creates that behavior, it is very uniform. They're both, you're, you're, you're acting the same in both ways if you look for a job in one and don't look for a job in the other. A similar thing that comes up in real life, right? People say, uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Well, this is a very difficult one because what that should say is, what I want other people to do with me is treat me the way I want to be treated. Okay, if that's your golden rule, then the United States wants to be treated by you looking for work and Nicaragua wants you to be looking, uh, come and not look for work. Make sense? If that's how you speak the golden rule, if that's how you phrase, frame the golden rule, then it makes absolute sense because you're doing it at a goal level. Treat me with respect in the way that I want to be treated. That's a relative. It moves based on me. But if I said, treat me in an absolute sense, okay, the golden rule says that I like people to correct me when I'm wrong. Only if I'm actually wrong. I don't like being corrected or yelled at when I'm actually right. And 
they are just angry with the answer, right? But I actually like being correct. So my children have been taught, if I say something wrong, they're like, no, instantly. And people are like, your kids talk to you like that? I'm like, yeah, because they respect me because I want to be right. I don't, if I'm wrong, I don't want to repeat it again. I want to get corrected now and not keep saying something that's wrong. I want to grow and improve, right? That's a unique thing for me, right? I'm on the autism spectrum. I have this very strong desire to not be perceived as correct, but to be correct, right? So I want to be corrected. So, but only when it's actually correction. Um, and then most people would find that offensive. I don't, I'm not okay with your kids correcting me. I'm not, right? They don't see that as respectful. I see that as them not respecting themselves, but that is how I see it, right? But the golden rule, if you, I used the golden rule and didn't use the goal level, treat me the way I want to be treated, and instead it treated other people the way, very, very absolutely, this is how I would want to be responded to, so I'm going to respond to you that way. They say things like I'm being condescending. They say that they're offended, that I'm rude. But to me, that they don't do those things to me, I find condescending and rude. They, they don't see me as valuable enough to, to correct. If you care about someone, you want them to be correct. They would want themselves to be correct. If they don't want themselves to be correct, they don't think very much of themselves. That's my viewpoint. So I have to learn, because I'm on the autism spectrum, how to treat other people in a way that I would find disrespectful because they find it respectful, right? Just like I don't want to be called sir. I find false formality to be disrespectful. But most people have been taught that it's respect. And so without thinking about it, they like when people say that to them. So you go to the store and they say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And you just have this little feeling of, oh, they're being respectful. To me, it's false and empty. And why would you waste the air? Because obviously you don't think anything special of me. You don't know who I am, right? I understand they're told to say that, so I don't feel offense. But the concept doesn't make any value to me. It's weird, right? So this is a really important thing to understand. That, and this is just framing why this is a relative thing. The way that you treat the United States well and the way you treat Nicaragua well are different, but the goal is to treat them both well. Now remember, in the same vein, if you are looking for a job and you want to treat yourself well, and this was the purpose of the video on which this was a question, you would not want a job in Nicaragua. It doesn't make sense from your perspective to want one, but I understand why it's easy to get the impression that you must, because if you were looking at it in reverse, if your context is what we just described, you would feel like I'm moving to a new country, therefore I must want work there. But that is not the case coming to Nicaragua. If you came and investigated, you would instantly say, or nearly instantly say, oh, now I understand why Scott was saying I would never want one here. The reality of the job I would have here would be so awful that there's no way it is good for me. So regardless of whether it's good for Nicaragua, that's an important thing to understand and contextualize. But for yourself, put yourself in your own shoes and say, what is my goal of going to work? Is it not to make money? Then you don't want to work in Nicaragua, right? If you want to make money, working in Nicaragua isn't the answer to that. And there's not an exception to that. We just explained the background as to why that's the case, but that's the reality. You're not going to find an exception, regardless of the fact that you're not going to find a an exception to the law that says you can't do it. Okay. For many who settle in the country, it seems that creating work in Nicaragua has been one of the best decisions that they've made. This is, first of all, no one has done this, right? Uh, I, I know of a couple people who skirt the rules and work in, in like not real businesses. Um, I actually am unaware of a single person who has come to Nicaragua and worked here, um, except for one who long ago came and he worked for the government in a very specialty temporary engineering role. There are really rare exceptions that you can come work here, but they require unbelievable amounts of exception. So this, I know it sounds like people must come here and settle and work here, but that is not the case. You are not finding people who did that once in a great while, you will find a Nicaraguan who has returned and decides to work here. But of expats, I am aware of zero. And I think Raku here is actually aware of zero. He just is, is imagining that they're working here. What about the examples you know of or you've spoken of in the past where people who moved to Nicaragua made local work opportunities that were positive, such as your recent profile of the Canadian who built vacation rentals? Okay, great. Perfect example. Under no conditions. So he's talking about Jeff and John Bramwell. They're brothers. They came down. They've been here. I'm pretty sure that's who he's talking about. That is, yeah, definitely Canadians with vacation rentals. Um, they came down and uh, built a business here in Nicaragua. 
at no point have they worked in Nicaragua. I mean, I haven't asked them, but I know what they do here. And they are absolutely not working in Nicaragua. That is not something they've ever done. So that's a perfect example of good expatting, right? They came down, they built a business, which of course, Nicaragua is begging you to come down and build businesses. I warn you to be careful about building businesses, but I do want you as well to come down and do it. I just don't want you to get burned, right? So when I give you warnings about business, jobs you don't want, period, end of story. You don't want, no matter what you've been told by anybody, you don't, they've lied to you, right? This is black and white, but investment, is good for Nicaragua. It could be good for you, difficult, but it could be good for you. But you need to be a wise business investor, do your research, know what your risks are, know what your risk uh, capabilities are. But that's true for business anywhere. It's just in Nicaragua, the game is upped, right? It's much more dangerous. So Jeff and John did not do this to make themselves rich. They did all of that in Canada, right? That's where their, their real income is from. That's where all that stuff is happening. That is funding projects here, right? Which we talked about in the video, but we're just distilling it. And at no point did they work here. So yes, invest, create jobs. Exactly what we talked about in the first section. How do you do good things for Nicaragua? Create jobs, don't take jobs, right? So if you're creating jobs, you're investing in businesses, you're creating businesses, absolutely, absolutely do that. Perfect. But those are not related to what we're talking about with jobs, right? Investing, like buying a business, buying into a business, that's very dangerous. Have your own business, right? Don't, don't get suckered into someone else's business. We happen to be making this on the morning that we did the breakdown of the RadPads scam. That was a big investment scam going on down here for, I mean, it was not very big, had very few people, but it was a scam It went on for a long time and everyone knew it. Um, but, but investing, and this is true in the US, Canada, anywhere, worldwide, investing in a company is heavily encouraged in all markets. It is generally open to people from all countries, rarely limitations on it. If there is, uh, it's generally because countries are protective of uh, outside influence and they wanna make sure that doesn't happen. So some countries that there, there is difficulties in doing that, like uh, Cuba, it's diff difficult to do that. North Korea, very difficult. China has a lot of limitations, right? So it's, it's not uncommon to have limitations, but if you were like, I really want to invest in China, China will find a way for you to do that. You just may not be able to be a major majority holder or I don't know, I have not investigated the Chinese investment. These are types of things that countries like that may take as measures to, pr to protect their population, but they still want foreign investment. They just may uh, limit the means in which you do it. Nicaragua really does not. You can do pretty much anything you want. Um, but those things are heavily encouraged by me, by Nicaragua, by everybody. So that's part of being a good expat. Yes, absolutely invest, um, but invest carefully. We, we don't want you to get burned, but we also want Nicaragua to benefit. Um, you've mentioned different owners and operators of restaurants and bars that seem to be popular and successful as well, well as hostels, English speaking in other language, tour guides, experienced curators, etc. cetera. So um, I'm not sure who he's speaking of. So one, I say this constantly, the restaurant and hotel bar operators are all losing money. They're not successful, right? If you're gauging success by making money, uh, but we're getting off track. I don't know what this has to do with jobs. I don't know why he's bringing these up because what does this have to do with the topic as we start? Because this was a, a response to a thing about working and uh, and then the first part of this is about working and now we're talking about investing, right? So uh, maybe I got off track. In the US and Canada, anywhere in the world, investing in a business and taking a job are utterly unrelated activities. They are not seen the same. Every country essentially in the world will beg you to be an investor, right? They will open the doors, they will give you help, they'll do anything they can. And most countries in the world, with rare exception, will make it extremely hard to take a job, right? It doesn't matter if it's Spain, it doesn't matter if it's South Africa, it doesn't matter if it's Thailand. If you want to be employed in their country, there's going to be barriers. Some countries make it quite easy, but there's still barriers, right? United States, pretty easy, but barriers. Vietnam, quite easy, but barriers. Nicaragua, impossible total barriers, right? So it varies a little bit, but they they all have some barriers to working because nobody wants unlimited workers, nobody. The United States wants a lot, but not unlimited. But investment, everyone wants unlimited investment. Some countries are just investment vehicles, the Cayman Islands. There's essentially nothing but investment, right? So, so these are very, very different things. 
But then there's also this everybody's losing money. This idea that they are successful. If you're saying that you know we're successful because uh, we're employing people and that's a success, absolutely. We are employing people. That we're putting money into the Nicaraguan economy that it wouldn't have had otherwise, is that success? Then yes, we're all successful because we're all putting in our own money um, and it's going into Nicaragua. So there's a lot of being good expats that's happening through these investments. But are we successful like a business or in a way like you would take a job? No. I don't know really anyone who's successful in that way. So certainly somebody exists in that context, <clears throat> but they are extremely rare, extremely the exception, not the rule. This is not a, not a thing that you do with the intention of making money. That is a very separate thing that we have covered in a lot of investment videos. We can do more. I have no problem digging into that, but that is separate from the discussion here, right? So can you invest here and be happy that you did? Absolutely. Should you? Maybe that's a personal decision as to what your risk is, how much you're willing to risk losing, how much you expect to lose. If you're coming here, and I say this constantly, if you're coming here to invest with the intention of making money and living off of that investment, you need to seriously rethink everything in your life because that is a fundamental business flaw, not just a Nicaragua thing, not just a relocation thing. That represents a flaw in your investment thinking. And so I'm a business advisor, so I'm taking off my Nicaragua hat. I'm putting on my investment advisory hat. If you're being pushed emotionally to invest in a place where it makes little to no sense to do so, and you can't explain the business logic of doing so, that means that all of your investing is at risk of not having any logic behind it. Investing is dangerous under the best circumstances, but when done extremely well, can, if you know how to, evaluate your business needs, evaluate risk, mitigate risk, spread risk, arbitrage, do these types of things, then the average investor in that space will make money, some a lot, some a little, but if you lack any of those things, the moment that emotion becomes part of your investment, the guarantee of losing your money becomes nearly complete. People who invest emotionally nearly always lose everything because for everyone who wins, someone has to lose. You can win just slightly more than the amount you lose because business does create value. But in general, you're competing against other business people and the people who are winning are not emotional. They're looking at what is my risk? How do I make money? Not I'm going to live here and I'm going to invest here regardless of whether it can make money, right? That that's just how you lose. So all these things are great examples of why you probably don't want to invest here because you're seeing success where there isn't. I don't know a hostel owner that's making money, at least from owning a hostel. I know of one who makes it from from scams, but they just happen to own a hostel as well. Um, I don't know any English language tour guides uh, who aren't Nicaraguans. I only know one tour guide actually, and they're Nicaraguan. Um, and they do speak English. Um, I, I guess I know two, but both are Nicaraguan. Um, experienced curators, I'm not sure who, I know what that means. I don't know of who that would be that I know of someone. Um, so all of these, and this is an important part of this onion that I'm talking about that I think there's a lot of misconceptions. Somehow there's this view of all these people being successful, but I'm not aware of anyone who's been successful, right? Um, maybe people who've been success successful because they were successful long ago and currently are not successful, but I don't know of anyone being what we would really term successful today. We know some people holding on. We know some people who are willing to, to continue losses. We know some people who have no goals of to make money. Yes, we know people who have businesses. I think people who don't invest heavily, uh, especially in private equity, right? If you're investing in like the stock market, it's a completely different animal. You wouldn't see the same things. People who don't run their own businesses often perceive that the act of owning a business or the act of having a busy business indicates success, and it does not. I can tell you that the busiest days we have on the beach are the days we lose the most. We rarely are able to get to a point where volume is able to create profits. In theory, you need volume to make profits, but you need a lot of different pieces. And quite often on the beach, now this is very isolated, when you get really high volume, your, your value per person drops dramatically. So while we can fill places to capacity, often they are also very slow nights. And so the, it's really easy for outsiders to say, oh, this is a really successful place. Well, define success. In many cases, we didn't open the places for the purpose of making money. That would have been crazy. 
right? But we're, we like to think we're sensible business people. We open them because we have other goals. We want to be able to go to those places ourselves. We want to make sure someone else doesn't control the place and do something bad with it. We want to have special food. We want to know, we want to know that it's going to be open when we want to have it open, right? Uh, there's just a, an enjoyment of eating at your own restaurant. Right? All these things are value. And to us, that's how we define success. But I don't think that's how you're defining success when you say there's all these different businesses and they're successful Normally, people imply, use that to imply making profits, in which case, that is absolutely not reality, right? Now, some people like the tour guide, he prices it and only gives tours when he has enough people paying enough money. So he's profitable when he does it, but he only gives a tour every one or two months. So it doesn't pay the bills, but it doesn't lose money through him doing the activity unless he had some other activity that could make him more money then it would be losing money. So it depends on how you look at it, but that's that's why that works the way it is. All right. <clears throat> you yourself, a confessed workaholic, have several jobs and businesses in the country that you enjoy. So right there, I do not. I have businesses in the country that I do enjoy that do not make money um, and are not what people would deem as successful. But like we said, this is a positive thing. Everybody involved wants you to invest in Nicaragua. That is absolutely the case. Um, but I have several jobs in the country. That is false. I have no jobs in the country. I've been very clear about this in many videos. I realize not everyone can watch every video, so, but this is something we've covered quite a bit. I cannot work in the country. I do not work in the country. I wouldn't want to work in the country. That would make no sense. Um, so that's why I make these videos. You don't want to work in the country. Trust me, as a self-professed workaholic who will always look for a way to work, one thing I know is I would never want to work here. I'm an employer here, and I know what people go through, right? Should you be an employer here? Yes, I'm an employer in many countries. And this is where I think we get into a lot of people have never worked. So the idea of relocating to a new country introduces a lot of concepts that most people don't interact with on a normal basis. I've been a business owner for 27 years, a successful-ish one for 25. The first two years, totally lost everything. And <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, idea of, of having staff abroad and the idea of where you live and where you work being utterly separate things, the concepts of where you're paid, where your work is done, how tax regimes work internationally, how they interact with each other internationally. These are things I deal with every day and have for most of my adult life. To me, a lot of these concepts are absolutely automatic and transparent. But for most people, the vast majority of people this is the first time that you will ever have dealt with multiple tax territories, multiple working zones, understanding what residency in one country means to another country, what citizenship in multiple countries means. Like a lot of these things are new and even people who are very experienced, I know he won't mind me sharing this, one of my viewers who's been a viewer like for a long time, moved to Nicaragua because of my channel, watches my stuff all the time, knows me personally, talks, has private chats with me, has direct channels to me, is a large investor in the country, has lots of employees in the country, has multiple offices in the country, works in multiple cities in the country, has been doing this for a long time, has lived in multiple countries, has residency in multiple countries, was working towards residency here, and was right about to file his final paperwork and I said, why are you getting residency? I talk about this all the time. Nobody wants residency. That's not a goal. I don't know. And I know you. There's nothing in your life that makes you want residency. He's like, but it would be cool to have an extra passport. I want to plant my flag, have a plan B, have the protection. And I said, well, first of all, passports don't really do that, right? Go see the videos from Near Shore Living. They kind of do in some circumstances, but not really. But I said, one, if you get a Nicaraguan passport, which you can't, but if you could, they make you give up all your other passports. He's like, whoa, whoa, like that's a really big deal. Like you can't plant your flag. You can't be a plan B. If you're going to get a passport here, you give up every, you give, it becomes your plan A automatically. You have no other choice right now. I know one of the people asking these questions is a dual citizen. He already has it. If you start with Nicaraguan and then add others, that's okay. But if you start with others and then add Nicaraguan, no, you have to give them up. Except for, I think Spain is a, is an exception, but like Honduras isn't, um, <clears throat> So, so that's one piece. And the second piece is residency doesn't get you on a path to citizenship. That is an unrelated thing that is so hard. I know of one person who's done it. He's on my channel. It took him 38 years. And his 
reasons for getting it are extreme. None of us are ever going to qualify the way that he did. And it took him 38 years and clearly was never going to leave the country. All right. So that was more like a, a, a recognition of his contributions to the country over a lifetime. They granted him the right to eventually, when he passes on, be able to be a Nicaraguan citizen and be buried in Nicaragua as a citizen. It's much, like, it didn't affect his life in any way other than that. Right. So now he gets to look forward to to ending his time as a Nicaraguan. But that is it. Like, that doesn't get you on a path to that. And he's like, oh, my gosh, why am I doing residency? None of this makes sense. He had been scammed by all these online people giving these plan B's, these plant your flag scams. Right. And they and they use well, residency is easy. And they take so some country somewhere uses residency to move you towards citizenship. That's not uncommon. Nicaragua does not. Technically, you can look up a, a law that makes it sound that way, but when you actually read the details, it doesn't. Um, so that's a really important thing, right? So, so these things, even for someone who's a business person, long-term, successful, makes a lot of money, um, works internationally, in Nicaragua, deep in Nicaragua, having been here, had no idea how residency worked or what it was. So that's an extreme case, I suppose. But for normal people who've never left their home country, beyond vacation, of course, um, have never worked abroad, have never dealt with these different territories, a lot of these things are based on, well, I've only seen my own country or immigrants in my own country, and this is how it seems to me the way that my country presents it to me. So you kind of have to extrapolate that other places. And there's whole things you may not realize that are going on, whole mechanisms. So I absolutely do not and have never worked in Nicaragua. I, I'm very clear in every video, the thing you want to do is work from Nicaragua, live here, work elsewhere. Cannot be more clear that that is the one thing that makes sense here. Or to retire, of course, don't work at all. But if you're going to work, you work somewhere else. Um, so talking about uh, businesses in the country that you enjoy, while they don't bring in an income that for your expenses and with your special skill set could match what you could make in another country, you also hope they will continue to increase to be more self-sustaining, right? Um, I mean, I don't want my businesses to lose as much money as they currently lose, right? Would I like them to be self-sustaining? Of course. But again, nothing to do with the discussion, right? I don't want to intentionally lose money with my businesses. But their goals are not to make money, right? So, yes, it, not losing money is a wonderful thing. But do I ever expect them to pay me? No. Were they created for the purpose of paying me? No. If they did pay me, would it be as an employee? No, absolutely not. They cannot. Nor would it make sense to. Because that's, again, just business things. You would take profits. If there was a situation where I made profits and wanted to realize profits, which often we wouldn't, um, then, then it would be paid as profits, which you're absolutely allowed to do in Nicaragua. No problem at all. You have to pay taxes on, but it's no problem. right? We have no plans to ever realize profits. We do hope that someday there are profits, but we want them to reinvest. We want to grow the number of people that we employ in Nicaragua. We have no interest in using any of our Nicaraguan businesses to ever make money, to ever, even if it's just offsetting something, that is not in our plans, it is not in our business model, it is not in our, uh, our, our business um, statutes of how the business behaves. It has no mechanism for paying out. Could we make it do it? Yes. But it has no mechanism for there to be profits. Most people do, right? This is We're abnormal in this, but he's using me as an as example, and I'm going to be the most extreme example of I would never work in the country, I have never worked in the country, and my investments in the country are not even for the purpose of profits, even theoretically. Um, so those are all really important things to understand from a me perspective, but you also have to understand that when you're using people like me to say, but they're successful, they're making money, they're... no, we're not, right? Maybe someone is somewhere, but none of those things are true. And so that perception that me and others are doing these things is very skewed, right? Now, uh, okay. A specific example is your new line of work with tourists curious about the country and possible relocation. So first about that. So that business is in the United States, not in Nicaragua. And two, that business was shut down because we started it up, gave a tour and said, there's a lot of liabilities in being in the country and partially just not because it's not a business here. 
Um, and it's uh, so that's an important thing to understand where a business is. Just because you perceive it as being in a country, imagine, right? So, uh, Raku, so imagine that a friend of yours is like, hey, I want to go see Mexico. I've never been there. Would you accompany me? And you say, well, yeah, but I, you got to pay me because it takes time. Like, I got to not be at work. I have to take my vacation time and, and go do this with you. Um, you've got to pay for my food and my flight and, uh, and pay for my time to be there. And they go, yeah, no problem. I just need you to accompany me. So that's cool. So they pay you and then you go to Mexico and hang out and then you fly home. Did you become a Mexican worker? No. The United States does not continue, wherever you're from, doesn't consider you a Mexican worker. Mexico does not consider you a Mexican worker. That is not how it is. You're an American worker who is paid in the United States, assuming that's where you're coming from. I'm just making that up. Um, you were paid in the United States to do something for an American and you did that task and you happen to go to Mexico as part of that task. That does not make you a Mexican worker. There are situations where there are countries that say you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to be a digital nomad. You're not allowed to be a non-digital nomad. There are countries that do that. They could not catch you in this case, like, the, but that's catching you, right? But in, in a uh, uh, general situation, this is simply working in the U.S. and then visiting Mexico, right? So one, I don't have that business. So that's important. Um, and I made a video about not having that business. I made the website that was for that business explains that there is no business. There's like a whole bunch of stuff. So that is not a thing that I do. Um, we decided, and then not because of, of anything to do with business stuff. What we decided, and there's a whole video that goes into this, so I'll be quick-ish, is that there are so many scam artists who get to a country or pretend they're in a country and then make just false information or poorly researched information or flat out lies because um, we had a video from another country that someone did that and just filled it with misinformation about Nicaragua to try to promote the place they were in. That's how we caught them. And uh, then we looked and like they had just arrived in the country. They were not even established expats. They weren't residents. They didn't have anything. They had no knowledge of the country, but they had no income. So they were immediately starting scams, not a real business, just scams, right? Which of course is not really legal anywhere, but it's hard to catch. Um, but so many people do this that honestly, there's so little money to be made, I don't care. Like, it's just not a business that makes sense. So that was the first thing. Like, is this the, the my future? No, it's never going to pay me what my actual job does. Why would I put in more effort to do this and have people view me as one of these greasy salespeople trying to scam them? Like down in San Juan del Sur, you get everywhere. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be Tony from, from Everything Nicaragua with every video he makes being an ad for someplace, right? They all pay him, I assume, to go do these terrible little ads that he did and uh, show off places. He doesn't even live in the country and he still makes these little ads for places and gets like 50 views, right? I don't want to be in any way associated with people like that. I have, I think, value to this channel and offering some kind of service that's like, we're going to help you relocate, we're going to do stuff, honestly waters that down without benefiting my life, right? I don't make enough money to qualify as this making my life better. Um, so that's just not something that makes sense and I'm not going to do. At least at this time. Would I, would I rule it out that I would never consider it? No, I'm not going to rule that out. But do I have a business that does that? No. And is it something I'm looking to grow? No. And did I ever do it in Nicaragua? No. All in the U.S. Um, there's a lot to read here. You charge a few hundred bucks for these guided and tour services. Now, one time we tried it from the U.S. Uh, and now we don't. Yet, you're still talking about how much a person or a doctor should expect to make in a year there. Right. Absolutely. So this is a major point of confusion if you think that an American working for Americans doing an American-only job that a Nicaraguan can't do, making a good, a, a, a kind of decent amount of money, not enough to justify doing it, but not as little as a Nicaraguan would make, somehow applies to what a doctor would make here. That's a fundamental, so I'm not, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm saying this is where peel the onion. You're missing the economics of jobs, right? What determines as an American the, uh, the amount that I am paid for an American job, right? As an American, I have a, a unique position. I'm the only reasonable person who can do what I do as a tour guide. Um, and I'm one of the only ones who doesn't sell something, but probably the only one. 
right? So I'm in a very unique position that you can't actually gauge my value. Um, you could gauge how much someone's willing to pay, but you can't gauge compared to other people. There's nowhere you can say, well, this guy does it for X and Scott is worth 5% more, 5% less. He's not quite as good, but he's okay, right? You can't use that. There is no one doing this with a skill set. And I've talked to companies that do this and they're like, no, there is none in Nicaragua. You're it, right? Maybe that's not true, but as far as we know, it's true. There's no one else with a channel that you can verify. So that alone, I'm the only verifiable one who could do it. And and it's a hundred, the value is that I'm an American. It's an American job doing an American thing. So that, that value is determined by America, right? Has nothing to do with Nicaragua, other than that is the topic that we will be discussing. But it is, you're looking for an American doing an American job. That is, that is the interaction. And then you're comparing that to being a doctor, which is a, don't take this the wrong way to all the doctors, it is a commodity job. It is a job that Nicaragua has essentially an unlimited number of doctors. And they all get paid roughly the same thing because there's nothing to make a doctor make more or less, right? So a doctor here makes more than minimum wage. Obviously, they're not being guided by minimum wage, but they are guided by market prices. And the average doctor makes somewhere between four and $800 per year. We're not sure. I, someone posted on the channel that it's 400 is the average. I am sure that is not true, but I know it's not 1,000. I know very competent doctors who take jobs at $1,000, $1,100 per year because it's so much better than being a doctor, right? So, um, you say, yet I'm still talking about how much a person like a doctor should expect there to make in a year. This is not an opinion piece. This is how much a doctor can make, right? I know uh, a doctor who, who is a doctor and makes more than these numbers. None of them make it through their work as a doctor. They all make it by owning other companies and being investors and having you know, family resources that they put into something that is not being a doctor. In some cases, it's related to medical. In some cases, it's not. But none of them make even four figures per month, not $1,000 per month. Have I ever heard of a doctor making that much? I'm sure there are. That's a, a number you could make. But that $1,000 a month is a barrier. I've never found a doctor able to make that working as a doctor. Okay. Even working in good hospitals. Even, I'm sure at Vivian Pellis they're making more than that. Right. I feel confident in saying that, but I'm just guessing. Right. We're not talking about big numbers. So anybody, it doesn't matter. If I was a doctor, right? My value here, assuming I was a decent doctor, right? <laughs> if, if you just gave me a job as a doctor, I'd be worthless. But if I was trained as a doctor and I worked here, my value would be about $600 a year if my Spanish was fluent. If it isn't fluent, my value is maybe $200 a year. I'd, I could only assist a doctor whose Spanish was fluent. That would be my value because I'd be working here. And not as an American, as a Nicaraguan. I'd be working a Nicaraguan job in Nicaragua instead of an American job in America, right? And in, in America, yes, I make decent money doing this, but a doctor would make more, right? So you have to, you have to apply the location, the specialty, the commodity, the market prices. You have to look at all these things. So these are things, and you always have to do this with all things. This is how you understand how jobs cost different amounts in different places um, around the world. All right, it's a good idea for some, but a bad idea, even morally or wrong, for another. No, it's uniform. That's the thing, is that you're perceiving this, and probably by now we've gone through this enough that you're realizing what's going on, but for everyone, you're perceiving things to be different or the same when they're not, when they're the opposite. Uh, so it's wrong for another who wants to do something similar or different in their own way. No, it's uniform. If you want to take a Nicaraguan's job and work in Nicaragua, it is illegal and unethical. If you are a Nicaraguan, like the other poster on this question, right? Uh, uh, Raku is not Nicaraguan, I sure think. And the other person who posted, I don't actually know his name, um, is, I know his handle, but not his name, uh, is Nicaraguan. He does have the legal right to come and work as a doctor in Nicaragua, but making 600, maybe $800 a month as a doctor who has access to the US market to do any number of jobs, medical or non-medical, trust me, a US doctor has, it, you know, it may not be the highest paid job category in history, but it's a good paying job. He's invested so much in being a doctor. He has so many things he can do in the United States that will pay that per hour, let alone per month. Why would he take away a doctor's job in Nicaragua and put someone on the street with no income who spent years training to become a doctor and now can't work because an American accessible working Nicaraguan 
came down and wants to make one hour's pay for an entire month's work. And he'd have to work like 48 hours a week, six days a week. That's how they make that much. So it's nonsensical. There's no situation where an American trained doctor wants to take that job. It doesn't matter that he knows he's taking away a job from a Nicaraguan. They don't want it. It may feel like he wants it until he finds out what it means to want it. Then there's no chance he wants it. And there's no chance you want to work here. Any feeling, any that makes you feel you want to work in Nicaragua means you're confused about something. There is no possibility. There's not even the fringiest, minutest, tiny possibility that if you're from the global north and want to move to Nicaragua, that if you understood the factors, you would ever even consider what it would take to, to work in Nicaragua. You would never want to do so. So this is always uniform. Live in Nicaragua, do work in the United States, do work in Canada, do work in Western Europe, work remotely. Yes, best thing you can do. Try to work locally. No, it is insane. While these relocation services would exclude almost all Nikas, no, they absolutely exclude all Nikas, for a few affluent visitors, this opportunity seems affordable. Yes, but it's because they're not, they're, they're, they're expats, right? They're buying the service in the United States, the service is from the United States. Uh, and presumably for those involved, this is a win-win. Yeah, except we determined it wasn't, but okay. So it's a little confusing when you argue that every job takes away from potential. It's not because it's not a job here. Um, who may do it differently or not at all, right? Well, not at all <laughs> is, uh, so even in that case, even if the job was here, it's unique and could in theory get an exception, but it doesn't have to because it's not here. There's no job being done here. Isn't this also true for restaurants and other businesses you own and operate? Absolutely not in any way whatsoever. One, I don't work in them in any capacity. I, I am a customer of my own restaurants. I do not manage them. I do not oversee their inventory. I don't look at their bank accounts. I don't even talk to the accountants and the lawyers. I mean, I do, but over drinks, like not, not as business, right? I have zero involvement with the restaurants other than going, oh, the fries weren't as good as they normally are today. I provide feedback. Sometimes I say, you know, we need more plants over here. I never make money from them, never get paid, right? So you could treat me as a volunteer because I never take money and have no way to take money and never will take money from them. And two, I don't work at them at all. So it would be really obnoxious to get paid by them because I do nothing. And I'm an investor in absolutely no way am I a worker. So what makes these different is that they are different. So the isn't this true? Absolutely not. So everything that you're giving as an example of, well, isn't this the exception? No, you're showing the rule. You're, you're, you're explaining my point. So what makes your personal exception so exceptional is that it's not exceptional. I'm doing it by the book. In every case, I never work here. I never get paid here. I do nothing in Nicaragua except invest. Now, I don't want to say that uh, an investor who opens a restaurant and then oversees it themselves is not allowed. We know some people who are very good investors and they work in their own restaurants, right? But let's be clear, we're using work in the casual sense. They are not employees of their own restaurants. They work and oversee staff. They employ lots of people. They're creating jobs. And they also directly oversee the restaurant. They are in the restaurant. They're making sure that the receipts go out. They're making sure that the, the caja, the, the cash box is correct. They're making sure that the food quality is correct. They're watching the oven. They're making sure people show up to work and all that stuff. But they're not taking salary. They can't. They're not being paid as employees. They are not Nicaraguan workers. They are investors who are watching over their investment. I understand, and I have said this before, that this creates a gray area where there's a certain amount of, under most circumstances, that you probably need to somehow physically be in Nicaragua looking at your investment in order to correctly oversee your investment and make it able to function. Nicaragua understands this, and in all cases that I know of, allows for this. Does it become a gray area where you're kind of working, but not being paid, you're not an employee, but you are physically involved in your business. Yes, and that does create a gray area. Does it become a place where you could, in theory, work around uh, some of the laws? It gives a spot where you may be able to work around them, right? But then you're getting into a, am I getting caught situation? And then you just reply the duck law. Does it, does it provide value to Nicaragua? Am I doing a good thing? Am I being ethical? And it just may not match the letter of the law? 
you're going to be fine. They're, they're not going to, they're going to overlook that. Okay. Yeah. This isn't what the law says, but you were being good. Or are you attempting to use the law to do something that would hurt Nicaragua and you're hoping that the law protects you? Maybe the law will protect you, but they can also kick you out, right? They don't need the law to kick you out. So, so that's just the thing. But what makes my personal exception so exceptional? Nothing. I am trying to live by example to show you, one, why you would never want a job, and two, why you probably don't want to invest, but we encourage you to do so, how to be a good expat and to do jobs elsewhere and bring the money into Nicaragua. Don't take money out of Nicaragua, right? That literally everything I'm doing is maybe not intentionally, but an example of how exactly to do the things I'm saying. Personally, I'd like to hear more about a future reality that I resonate more with. Well, so I'm telling you, you don't resonate with this. You're not understanding the situation. There's no way you would want. I mean, I understand you want Nicaragua to become a place with loads of jobs and a super rich place, but then the cost of living would no longer be good. You wouldn't want to live here, right? It would be a completely different place, utterly different in all ways. So what makes it seem, you know, you're kind of looking for the best of both worlds. And of course, that would be great. You want a place that has low cost of living, no one, you know, everything's cheap, everything's safe, people have lots of spare time, there's early retirement, but then you want it to be able to provide jobs. Yes, that would be a perfect, amazing thing, but those things can't coexist. To be able to do that, the other would have to go away, right? And, and Nicaraguans, of course, probably lean that way. They would prefer that. They will take a higher cost of living as long as everyone can work and make more money. That's fine. That's not a problem, but it would change your desire to be here. You, and then, then you would want to live in the United States where they would have become poor and then uh, work to Nicaragua. I appreciate hearing about and from the shining examples of who were once visitors, fell in love with the country, wanted to stay and figured out how they could make it work without working remotely online. Um, yeah, but are there any? Like, so first of all, why are you opposed to working and you say online, but there's other ways, you know, kind of other ways to do it. Um, but I feel like you're you're cherry picking a thing. I don't want to do this thing, so I'm going to push for something that doesn't make sense. Um, working and teaching remotely. So the, so now you're just, this is jumping the shark. So this doesn't make any sense. Working and teaching remotely and sinking to time zones on the other side of the Pacific with opposite work times doesn't seem as healthy for a long term situation in Nicaragua. No, definitely not. Why would you bring that up? What does that have to do with anything unless you're from Thailand or something and I don't realize it, right? If you're from the global north, right? One of the reasons that we specifically, and this is in all my videos, one of the reasons we chose Nicaragua is that it's in the main time zone with the US. It's directly under Chicago and uh, um, uh, uh, Dallas, right? It's in the middle of the US and Canadian time zone. So if you go to the East Coast, you're off by one hour. You go to the West Coast, you're off by two hours. It's you're, you're never off by more than Americans are off of themselves and less than Canadians are often off by themselves because they have five time zones, right? So if you're working with that zone, you're not, you don't have to sync up. That's the whole point. You can't be more in sync by being in Nicaragua than you can in the US. We're all in the same spot. So that's not a thing. Why would you mention teaching? That's not a thing to do online in most circumstances. Are you allowed to? Of course you can. That's not a very good paying job. If you're a teacher, why did you become a teacher if you don't like teaching? If you're not a teacher, why are you mentioning teaching? It doesn't make any sense. But why would you mention the other side of the Pacific? So all the places on the other side of the Pacific, except for maybe Japan and South Korea, but South Korea is kind of in the middle, don't have high incomes. They're not the global north. So why would you seek another country with low income that you wouldn't want to work in as the place to work remotely instead of the global north, where presumably we have access, like this is the whole point, is that you have access to these high paying places that need the work. They don't need to sink to the, I don't understand at all, right? If you're going to cherry pick the worst possible online job, well, of course it's gonna sound bad. But of course we could say, well, why would you wanna make under minimum wage to teach English in Nicaragua? So an English teacher in Nicaragua makes about $164 per month. They get paid about 180, but they are expected to pay about $20 for supplies. So the actual take home is about $164. So let me ask you, this is what I'm hearing. If you're going to cherry pick a teaching job, presumably English, because what else would you teach on the other side of the Pacific, that will pay generally maybe three or four, maybe $500 a month online, you don't have to leave home. What I'm hearing you say is you think it would be healthier and better to make $164 a month earning that in Nicaragua you're not allowed to, but you want a world where you can. Um, and you have to commute to work. 
you have to go to meetings, um, you have to deal with really long working hours, no air conditioning. Um, why do you feel that that is better? Why do you feel that is healthier? And why do you mention that instead of a teaching job or something else online in the time zone where most of the jobs are? So all the jobs nearly are either in Europe, which is fewer, or North America, which is more. So the time zones are either off by eight hours or none. You're right on the time. And they pay really well. If you're from the global north and looking to move to Nicaragua, you would have access to jobs that have to pay you pretty decently. You're looking at making thousands of dollars a month without having to leave home versus $164 to teach in Nicaragua. Or if you were a doctor, $600 for a month in Nicaragua. Like, If you want to talk about long-term and healthy, every single Nicaraguan is just jaw-dropped right now that you're suggesting that you think it would be better to earn next to nothing and suffer with the Nicaraguans and not bring in foreign income to help them. This is the thing that would shock them, that you'd be voluntarily seeking to be put into the horrible situation that they are, to suffer with them in order to avoid a situation that would make you affluent and help them. Everybody loses, especially you, by trying to do this. You would give up your power, you would give up your money, you would give up your sanity, you would give up your great working conditions, you would give up the strongest advantages of Nicaragua and take their strongest penalties. But why? Why do you perceive that as a positive? I understand some people don't like sitting at a computer, they don't wanna work online, but that is the world, right? Saying you don't wanna be online is kinda of like saying you don't wanna to go to an office, you don't wanna work for the man, you don't wanna, okay, you can invest and make your own careers, right? Which I did, but it's online, <laughs> right? So uh, what resonates with me is the idea that an individual with expertise, passion, and a love of Nicaraguan country, all fantastic things, can actually support the local economy and meet their basic expenses. So that is a great idea. I don't know anyone who's done that. I'm not saying that they're absolutely zero, but this is kind of like saying, um, I wanna be in America, um, I don't want to work for another company. Phew, who does? Some people do, but very few. Most of us want to work for ourselves. I want to work for myself. Um, I don't want to leave the small town I'm in. I want to make enough money that I can support myself and be good for the economy. Phew, it's a great idea. But the average person in the United States who tries to do that loses their business, right? It isn't something that you just snap your fingers and get to do. And in the United States, the easiest market at least the easiest large market on earth to do this in, you're essentially guaranteed to fail if you tried to do that. Nicaragua, while not the hardest, nears much closer to the hardest in the world than it does to the easiest. So what you're saying is, um, what resonates with me, let me reword this, what resonates with me is the idea of being the unique one out of 10,000 who somehow managed to come up with a business plan that made enough money to survive on. And you don't mention this, but this has to be part of this, that you're able to do it now because essentially all the people who have done this did it back when the country was doing much better. They got to the point of profits and are either running with no overhead now and able to make their profits because they're not calculating the overhead over time or that they, they just, they're running off those, those savings. Are there businesses that actually make money in Nicaragua? Mm, yes, somewhere. Are they doing so without having gotten around very early, getting in when, when it was a different situation? There must be someone. I know of no one, literally no one. So when you, you say these things like, I wish I knew these people, I wish I knew how to do this, Right? This doesn't apply to any person I've ever met in Nicaragua. Right, So it's a wonderful idea, but it's kind of like saying I, I, what resonates with me is winning the lottery. I wish that I could do something that no one else could do. Not that they're not allowed to do. Of course, Nicaragua wants you to start a business with expertise, passion, and love of the Nicaragua country and support the local economy. Absolutely. We all want you to do that. None of us know how you can do that unless you give up the meet basic expenses piece.
That's the part that creates the problem. How do you plan to do that to meet your big, we all wish we could meet our basic expenses by doing that, right? That would be the most amazing thing. I have businesses, it would be amazing if they met any expenses. It'd be amazing if they just didn't lose money. To also make money, to pay me to meet my basic expenses, that would be incredible, but unrealistic, right? So that's where, and I'm not saying that's impossible. I'm saying that literally you're looking at the one in 10,000, right? You're looking at being a lottery winner to be able to get that. So yeah, that resonates with all people. But how do you plan to do that, right? And this is, again, not in line with the discussion about jobs. This is about starting a business, right? In theory, the way that you kind of word it, it sounds like starting a business that you'll make enough profits on. Sure, you're welcome to try that. But the experience will be, are you able to actually make profits or do you live off of your investment, right? And then the other question is, um, to consider it a success, it must beat the income baseline that you could do by investing the same amount in your own country remotely, right? So if you uh, are looking at, for example, in investing, we use um, uh, S&P 500 index funds as the baseline. This is the safest way to make good money in the United States. If you have access to that, which Nicaraguans do, you can make roughly nine, nine and a half percent per year on average. It fluctuates year to year, but that's kind of your average. If you're going to invest in a Nicaraguan business, you need to be able to beat that or you are not successful. You can't define success by making money. You have to define sex success by being beyond that number, by being beyond what no effort would have netted you had you done that. And so for a business to earn that kind of return, you put in 100,000 and it returns 9,000 to you per year. While that's not a bad business situation, that is not profitable compared to a baseline right? You're being eroded by uh, uh, your actions, right? Your, caught, your lost opportunity has beaten you. Now, if you can make 10%, yes, you're making money, but that 1% that you made is only $1,000 a year on a $100,000 investment. How much could you have made had you worked remotely? You only need to earn $100 per month working remotely to beat that number. Had you taken that $100,000 and just put it in a bank account, not a bank account, an index fund in the US, let it accrue its, its interest, and instead you worked online for $100 per month, you would be in the same position as that 10% gain. Does that make sense? That's the math you have to do. So to be successful, to have it make it make sense, you have to really think, is this investment going to make enough that the time I put into it, the risk I take with it is justified? Do I have a reason for doing that? Or is it just this emotional drive that this is how I want to do it? Okay, but you, you can't determine the market, right? We all wish Nicaragua was rich. We all wish it was easy. We all wish that investing would be just make money. We all wish it stayed safe and, and low cost of living while doing so. But the, we all wish we could win the lottery, right? So that's kind of where this is falling. And yeah, so it's a great wish to have. But until you have a business plan that makes that happen, I don't, I don't know where to go with it. And, he's, and then you continue at the same time by creating work opportunities for themselves and eventually others that make sense and bring value to, to those involved. Of course, right? You want to create jobs. You want to keep yourself busy. All that's fine. And you're welcome to do so as long as you're not working here, right? That's, that's the only thing. Uh, in trying to make sense of these issues, it's also impossible to ignore the fact that for years, hundreds of thousands of Nicaraguan citizens have been leaving every year and not returning. Well, I don't know why that's a thing, right? Because there's not jobs here. There are jobs in the North. The North advertises that if they come, they will get, they'll become wealthy and have all these things and then does things to make it very, very difficult to return, right? I know tons of Nicaraguans who've gone up and do not have the right of return, right? They, Nicaragua gives them the right of return. The United States does not give them the financial power to return. It, it keeps them uh, essentially trapped. It's a, it's a debt loop. Right. But when you go up as an immigrant, you're essentially guaranteed to be caught in that debt loop. It is an extremely rare immigrant who has the power uh, to return to Nicaragua. But when we talk to people up there, so many want to return and we see people returning all the time. But the lack of jobs here does make it difficult. Once they're up there, often they've given up their life savings. They have nothing to return to. Uh, many people give up their businesses or homes to make the journey up there because they're told that they will make so much money that they think it's worth giving up everything, all of their family investments over, in some cases, centuries uh, to go. 
At the same time, Nicaragua is wanting to expand its tourist infrastructure for the years ahead. I don't believe that's true. We've actually talked about that. They got burned by expanding their tourist infrastructure, and so they've actually pulled back completely. And tourism, while they're not turning off tourists, they're not investing in it. There's extremely little going on uh, to, to encourage tourism um, beyond just the baseline of like, it's a beautiful country, come visit. But tourist infrastructure is not an investment area, very specifically. Um, so this is this is just a, this is Costa Rica has that, not Nicaragua. Uh, it's not only prudent, but in line with the goals of the government's Department of Tourism to help build this infrastructure out. If you're if you're in tour, the Department of Tourism their interest lies in that way. But at the higher government level, it does not. They want in-tour to stay at a relatively low level. They certainly want them to be successful. They don't not want tourists. But they do not want the economy to be based on tourism. We specifically have a lot of videos. We're scared here in Nicaragua of ending up like Costa Rica. That's specifically one of the things we're scared of. And one of the things that Costa Rica allows is the ability to work. Some of these things that you're mentioning are exactly underpinnings of why Nicaragua doesn't want to allow employees. We don't want from from abroad. We don't want to end up in the situation that Costa Rica finds itself trapped in now. Right? That's a real concern here. People really sit around talking about how much we don't want to end up like Costa Rica. So these are really important things in that context. Is it not only prudent, but in line with the goals of the government department of tourism to help build out this infrastructure? So no, I don't believe so. Not in the greater sense to create more opportunities for business, for visitors while aiming to create more jobs in the community. So none of that applies to these things, right? If you want to build out a tourism infrastructure, um, I don't see how that connects, right? Uh, by allowing, uh, Americans to work in or whoever to work in Nicaragua does not encourage or discourage the building of tourism infrastructure. Um, it doesn't create or not create uh, hotels or whatever. Um, it would simply put more Nicaraguans on the street unable to eat. So uh, if anything, it is in line with tourism keeping Nicaraguans working, guaranteeing that the jobs go to Nicaraguans and not Americans. Um, nobody wants to come down and stay at an American hotel and have to pay American rates because you have Americans working there expecting American pay. Um, most people don't want to come down and experience Americans working everywhere. Uh, why did they come to Nicaragua if they want to be in America, right? That doesn't make sense. So, and it doesn't work for Nicaragua to then be like, oh, we put all these people on the street. Whoa, tourism, right? No, absolutely. So I think because of the things you're saying, doesn't Nicaragua want to support tourism? They do, they just don't want to make a big investment in it. The things we're talking about are supporting tourism, right? Putting Nicaraguans to work helps tourism far more than putting them out of work and leaving them on the street. Uh, thanks again for the ongoing discussion uh, and evolving insights. So, yeah, and I'm really sorry. I don't know if you guys can hear it. There's a saw in the background. I've been so angry, but for a month, they've been doing construction outside and it's not mine and they do it all hours of the day, and, and this is my studio, and I have very little way to get around it. I'm really hoping the Final Cut Pro is able to cut it out. Fingers crossed that it's not too bad. Um, so all of this, I think, is is this onion, right? Understanding in, in other contexts, we have the same thing with the residency and the citizenship, and there's all these pieces, and people you know, say, well, I want to come down, I need to be a resident. And you're like, yes, you need to reside here. But the term resident here refers to a couple different things depending on the context. And someone pointed, there's this law, you become a, re a tax resident after 181 days. Yes, you do. It also doesn't affect you in any way. But if Canada was to ask you, are you a resident there legally? You'd say, yes, I'm a legal resident. I didn't file anything. It just the country acknowledges me as a legal resident. There's zero paperwork, zero acknowledgement, nothing happens. And people say, oh, so that gives me all these things. No, it gives you nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, it is a complete uh, misnomer of the, the misconception of the entire thing that, that residency gives you these things. We have this thing we call residencia because it is the residency of visa. And that gives you very little. And people just can't accept that it must not give you other things. Because Mexico does, because Colombia does, that must be what residencia means, but it's not. Nicaragua's residency is completely unique, and it doesn't give any of the things that people normally associate with it. I'm not saying that no one ever wants it, but it's very rare, right? So that's an onion, though. You have to understand what citizenship is, what residency is, what visas are, how they apply, what the tourist visa does, how it all works on the ground in Nicaragua, what the actual benefits of this are. But when you talk to people who haven't come and done it here, consistently, it's, I must need it. And they don't trust the people on the ground who are like, but why? Can you tell us what you need about it? And they're like, 
they, and they no one ever lists. I, that's once in a while someone's like, I will not do this thing. I have to do this thing. And once in a while it's true, right? Like it's like I can go to Managua, but I can't go to Costa Rica. You know, sometimes it's like a very uh, that takes five percent more work. I'm not willing to do it. Um, and and I'm never going to leave the country, so I don't have any of the offsets that normal people have. Okay, those exceptions exist, but the point is there's this really complex. Unless you understand all the layers. Any one individual layer is meaningless. So if we say residencia requires, let's say, the, the $1,000 per month income, and someone says, I can't come to Nicaragua, I don't make $1,000. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No one said that. We said the residencia takes that. Well, I need the residencia. Why do you need the residencia? And then you start peeling away. Because they have this assumption about the residencia, they then have this further uh, assumption that they need the $1,000, but they don't, right? So that's, that's really important stuff. And so I think the same thing's happening here. If you, you have these layers of what does it mean to live in a place? What does it mean to work in a place? What does it mean to be an employee? What does it mean to be an investor? What does it mean to have employees? What does it uh, mean to, to take profit versus take salary? Like these are very discrete things in every country I know. Nicaragua, US, Canada, all of them have these same mechanisms. And they're very discrete. For example, we say you can't buy a car in Nicaragua unless you have residencia. And people go, oh, I can't have a car. Well, like, no, we said you can't buy a car. But you can own a company that has a car. Legally, that's not you owning a car. But you do own a company, and the company owns the car. What's your goal? Well, I want to be able to drive. Oh, you don't need to own a car. You need to have access to a car. Well, I don't want someone else to own it. Well, they don't. You own the company that owns it. You're the only human who owns it, but you don't own the car. right? And, and these same things happen in the U.S. It's just in the U.S. you get used to which things are like this, and it's just part of life or whatever country you're from. But in Nicaragua, almost all these things are unique and new. So when you're looking at it, you have to have the big picture. And with this, so things you need to trust me on, right? You can ask all the questions you want. We will dive into it. And this is for everybody, right? But you have to trust me. It doesn't matter if you can find a way to legally work in Nicaragua. You will never find a way, but it doesn't matter if you did. You don't want to. You have to trust me on that. There's run the math, come up with how you expect someone to pay you including yourself, why would you pay yourself an amount of money you'd be willing to take and pay taxes? Remember, if you work in Nicaragua, you would have to pay taxes once you're over 181 days. So you would, you would take a salary that is absolutely tiny and then have to pay taxes on top of it. But for most of the places we're coming from, this one's not universal, but US, Canada for sure, most of Europe, right? Not only would you not have to pay, if you work remotely, to those countries from Nicaragua. Not only does Nicaragua not charge you taxes, but most of those countries don't charge you taxes or don't charge you as much of taxes. Right? We're going to do a deep dive as a non-daily for the United States onto their tax regime because the United States gives you basically $120,000 per person per year tax credit, which is an astounding amount of money. Enough that I don't know of anyone living in Nicaragua from the United States who isn't significantly impacted by it. Very few people understand it. So we want to dig into that, especially for people who are looking at coming to Nicaragua. But I know people who live here who aren't taking that credit because they simply don't believe it's true. It's so good and so many people complain so much about the U.S. and it's got its problems. This isn't one of them. And they complain so much about the U.S. taxes that people just assume there's no reason to look into whether they get benefits. But the U.S. puts an incentive on people working from abroad that is so extreme that, I mean... The U.S. is basically begging you to come do this. Work from Nicaragua, but not in Nicaragua, right? Uh, putting all these pieces together, hopefully this is really clear. But I know it's it's so many pieces. But you one, you have to let go. When it comes to jobs, when it comes to careers, when it comes to investing, you have to let the emotions go. None of this is about emotions. None of this is about what it looks like appearances. What matters is what are the mechanisms that allow you to do work that makes you happy, what are the mechanisms that allow you to get paid enough to justify doing work? If you're not getting paid enough, why is it work? Don't go to work to not make money. That doesn't make sense. Why would you want to invest if it's not going to make you money? If you're like me and you can come up with logical reasons, I want to employ people. I don't care about losing money. I want to have a restaurant to eat at that I choose the menu. I don't care about losing money. If you can say those things, if you can logically make a list, this is why I want to have a business. Absolutely. Great. Please do that. If you can come up with an actual business plan based on Nicaragua needs. Now, first of all, if you were going to invest in Nicaragua, it should always be done after living here for many years. It should never be even entertained before you live here. 
This has nothing to do with Nicaragua. Nowhere on earth should you be thinking about the business you will start before you get there. Right? You can dream all you want. The realities on the ground will change everything in your life in the first few hours, let alone the first days and months and years. You will instantly have an appreciation of so many things. I could spend a hundred hours making videos explaining business environment in Nicaragua, and it would never make it as clear to you as your first half a day driving around Managua after you've gotten out of the airport. There's nothing I can do to convey that much information. There's just no way. There's a feeling. There's a visibility. You can say, "There's what, oh, that's how people are working. That's what stores look like. That's how many there are. That's how dense it is. These are the types of businesses. Okay, I'm starting to put together. But it'll take you years to understand. You're at a major disadvantage to the market. And when you're outside the country, you have no, no way to even frame the market. No amount of my channel can provide that much framing. So when it comes to business, this is a general business rule. As my you know, business hat on. You should never be looking at even thinking about business investment. If you're willing to just lose a ton of money, you're just, I really want this restaurant, nothing else matters, you know, whatever. But when you're talking about potentially making money, you want to potentially live off of it. You've got to be so on the ball. You got to know the business market. You got to know the opportunities. You got to know the legal problems. You got to know the hassles. You got to know the licensing. You got to know everything for your specific businesses, right? The licensure, all this stuff. You have to know it. You have to know it better than the average person because there are businesses all over Nicaragua that are making money, okay? This is really important. The average Nicaraguan business that is successful makes less than $200 a month in profit and is only able to function because the owner is the only operator and they operate it out of their house. So they get a tax credit on their house they basically pay nothing for the incorporation. They leverage rules that only exist for Nicaraguans. They work it themselves, and they do so on a scale that basically is overlooked from a tax and oversight regime. They are given this ability to work from home at this minor scale. That is what successful normally looks like in Nicaragua. So when you're talking about you really want a business that can meet basic needs, okay, but if you're going to do this in Nicaragua, how is your business going to be so much more successful than the same business would be if Nicaraguan ran it. Because it, there's so many Nicaraguans here who are running businesses, who have experience and access. They have so many advantages that you don't have. If you plan to have a business here and you want it to meet your basic expenses, unless you lower your basic expenses below the, the basic expenses of a Nicaraguan, then you're talking about a business that needs to outperform traditional Nicaraguan businesses. And while that's not technically impossible, the probability of an expat being able to outperform a Nicaraguan business where they have access to cheaper labor, they already know the market, they probably already have family resources, they have a whole bunch of things that they can leverage that you can't. So they're way ahead of you. How is your business planning going to allow you to make a business plan where you're going to do something they can't do? Maybe you can, right? It's probably arbitrage back to your home country. Right? Oh, we're going to make a product here and ship it to my home country. And it's because I'm also running a business in the other country that Nicaraguans can't do. They don't have access to it. They don't have knowledge of it. They don't have the right to fly there. The U.S. bars them from going, right? The U.S. cheats on the free trade thing to be able to give Americans these advantages. Canada does the same thing. Their citizens can go do business places that Nicaraguans can't. So they keep Nicaraguans from, from leveraging those opportunities in many cases. Unless you're leveraging that stuff you're at a major disadvantage. Just as a Nicaraguan coming to the United States is at a massive disadvantage. They don't have family that can help them with things. They don't have knowledge of the market. They have to gain all that over time and they will never have quite as much as the American who's born there. You will never have as much as the Nicaraguan that is born here. And so even when you're talking about things you're allowed to do, investing in a business, right? All the businesses out on the beach, the expats make a fraction of the money that the Nicaraguans do. Right now, we're all losing, so right now that's an extreme case. Most of the Nicaraguans actually do make money. They know exactly what works. They know exactly what Nicaraguans work, want. They know exactly how to hire and do things at the lowest possible cost. They, they you know, are willing to do conditions that we're not willing to do. They're willing to work for an amount of money that we're you know, not really willing to work for. Right? I'm not going to give up my high-paying U.S. job in order to make $100, $200 a month in a, in a, a restaurant um, that I'm running and I have to work 
60, 70 hours a week flipping burgers in order to bring home minimum wage if I'm lucky and I risk it. What if things get slow? I don't make anything because I'm the investor. I'm not going to risk my job in order to do that. Right? It doesn't make any sense. I would give up all this, uh, this luxury of an air-conditioned office, the luxury of being able to only work 40 hours a week if I decide, the luxury of being able to sit in a chair and have people make me food, the luxury of making good money, being able to go out and do stuff, all for a risky, really low amount of salary. That It just doesn't logically make sense. I know some people really hate the idea of working online, but um, you know, everyone I know either works online, every, every expat either works online, is retired, or flies back to the global north in order to work. We have people who live here, and every six months they're flying back, working, and then coming back and living off half the year, which is not ideal. I'm not saying you should do that. Some people like that, but that's how people are putting food on the table. Working here just doesn't make sense. And investing here is extremely difficult. So you really have to, you can't approach it from a, this is what resonates with me, this is what I want to do, this is, you have to approach it like you would Normal job, does it pay? Does it make sense? Am I allowed to do it? Emotion doesn't play in. And from business, yes, emotion may drive you into which businesses you're willing to go into, but all business anywhere in the world is determined by, I have a business plan. Here's how I'm going to leverage the real world factors and believe it will be profitable to do so, right? Labor arbitrage, unique opportunity. Yeah, maybe you're able to find a hostel somewhere. You're able to put up huge amounts of money. You're willing to lose money versus your baseline. You're willing to let it erode from inflation. I said erode, right? And and you're willing to work at it and do all kinds of things. And maybe your ability to market in your home market is better than a Nicaraguan's. You know more of what someone's going to look for. And by doing that, you're able to make some money off of this, maybe, right? You've got to identify what thing makes you unique. This is general business. It has nothing to do with Nicaragua. You have to identify why will your business succeed? Is it something no one has ever thought of before? I've yet to have an expat come up with that, right? But in theory, is it something no one's ever thought of before? Is it something that no one else knows how to do and you do? Do you have access to a market no one else has access to? Like you're from a country that no one else, you know, you're from uh, uh, trying to come up with a country that no one knows here. Well, one of our people is trying to come from Libya. Maybe he has access to businesses in Libya that need something from Nicaragua. Nicaragua needs something from Libya. No one else from Libya is here. So they're able to, you're able to create a trade back and forth that's unique. Okay, that would be a unique situation. Do you um, have an amount of investment that no one in Nicaragua can touch, you, you know, 100 million, 500 million plus dollars. So you're gonna build something on a scale no one else can do. Do you have government contracts that no one else can get? Um, do you, you know, do, have you just found a spot where no one has put in a business? There's just, there's no restaurant in this village. They all went out of business. Everyone got sick, uh, uh, someone retired and just no one took an interest. Okay, you, you've identified a unique gap in the market and you're gonna swoop in while there's a temporary uh, gap and try to get, you gotta come up with what that thing is, but you start with the business opportunity. You don't start with, I really want to do this thing that's unidentified. Business just doesn't work that way. Business is very punishing in the best of times. This would be the worst of times. So in all these cases, right? Like, great, go out, show Nicaraguans all the ways that great things could happen. But remember that you're always talking about, well, a Nicaraguan could have done this too. And if they did it, our expectations would be this. If your expectation is not to just make $200 a month, but to make $2,000 a month, how? I'm not saying you can't, right? That's not unethical as a business owner, but it's illogical, right? What would give you 10 times the likely profit power of someone who's almost certainly guaranteed to be in a much stronger position than you to do the same business. Okay, ask questions, get down. I know this was super long. I've run through two batteries on the camera, but it's really important to dig through these things because it's so easy to look at individual pieces and not see the big picture of why it all comes together, why there's no possibility that you want a job here, why there's essentially no possibility that you will make a business here, why there's no way the people you're perceiving as being profitable are actually profitable. Right? They've lost so much in essentially all cases. They may have functional businesses. They may be busy. Those are not 
you know, profits. And a lot of people want to appear profitable. And so we'll do things that gives you the impression that they're making money because that makes them feel good, right? How many CEOs go and sit at the country club and act like they're making great decisions and doing great things. But when you actually start questioning them, you realize they're idiots and are losing money like crazy. And they're just living off of their spouse's income, right? Ah, uh, his wife has a good job. She pays him to run his little side business. And he just drinks with his buddies and brags about being a CEO. Little do you know, it's 100% just his wife paying for him to have a good job title, right? That's a really common thing. People do this all the time. And a lot of people are in the businesses they're trapped in. I know so many businesses. We're constantly being approached by hotels. Please bail us out. You guys are willing to lose. We can't lose anymore, right? This is a constant thing. Places that people go, these are the wild, successful. Everyone knows these places. They must be making money. They're the ones asking for the bailouts, the biggest places. So keep that perspective that... Yeah, it's possible someone's making money. I'm not saying that there's absolutely zero businesses that have made it, but ask yourself, did they come in now while the times are tough? Are they making money now? Or are they making money that they actually made a long time ago and they're just realizing it now? If you can even identify it, why do you feel that there are successful businesses in Nicaragua? Where are these? And are they actually in Nicaragua? For example, all those real estate agents that you see down in San Juan del Sur, one of the reasons they get away with what they're doing is they're not doing it in Nicaragua. They work outside the country in most circumstances, not all, but most. And so they're actually, in many cases, when you're buying and selling homes, that doesn't even happen in Nicaragua. A Nicaraguan house can transact in the U.S. or Canada. They do all the time, right? And it's completely legal. But if you have a real estate agent that happens to be here and a transaction happens in Canada, but they're Canadian, you're Canadian, everybody's Canadian, that was a Canadian transaction. There's no part of Nicaragua, in most cases, happening. Right? Maybe a contract, but only a contract. So these things are much more complex than you often see. And there's no way from the outside to say, ah, oh, this is Nicaragua, that's not Nicaragua. You can't tell outside of like, yeah, someone who's fixing my car at an auto dealership, you know they're in Nicaragua. But online jobs, finance, banking, contracts, lawyers, these things are happening extranationally. And people don't realize it. If you're not used to this stuff, it just seems like well, it must be in Nicaragua. They bought a house in Nicaragua. They have a, a store advertising in Nicaragua. But is the business happening here? In most cases, not. And it doesn't make sense to. If you're a real estate agent and you do business here, you're, you're on the hook for all kinds of liability. But you do that transaction extranationally, and you can disavow anything you want. There's no way to sue them. There's nothing you can do. They are indemnified because you shouldn't have done business in a different jurisdiction. Canada won't protect you because why did you use, why did you buy property in Nicaragua instead of Canada? Not our problem. Nicaragua won't protect you. Why did you do the transaction in Canada and not in Nicaragua? It's not our problem if someone ripped you off in Canada. Suddenly you're unprotected, right? So businesses wanting to take advantage of you, I'm not saying real estate are the ones doing this, but if you were a real estate agent here, you would want to operate in another country and just physically be here showing houses, but getting paid and working and being from somewhere else, right? So one of the con the things that we need to give a little context on is think about the fact that we're all travelers. We're not Nicaraguans, right? So think of us as long-term people on vacation, because that's exactly what we are, right? Even if we have residency, we're still, you know, Canada, US, Germany, England, doesn't matter. They perceive us as on a really long vacation, and legally, that's what it is. So if you were on vacation in Nicaragua and you decided to do something, if you took a job while on vacation, you expect that to be illegal, right? That's just normal, right? You, you don't vacation in the U.S. and get to take a job. That would never be the case, right? So, so that's uniform. Now, I understand there's more to this. You, you say, well, what if I got residency? Residency doesn't give you anything. But it could in some markets, just not here. So... If you're talking about people who are travelers and then they want to invest in things and how it works, well, a traveler who's doing all their business, right? You're just, you have regular business, you have friends in your home country and you're doing business with them. And sometimes you take vacations together. Sometimes you take vacations separately. You happen to go to Nicaragua. Does Nicaragua become part of your business? Whether you're here for a day, a week, a month, a year. That is a really exposing thing. Oh, wait, if I was just there for the afternoon as a tourist passing through, would it have triggered that my business moved to Nicaragua? If not, then time doesn't matter. There is no rule that says the amount of time that you're doing business somewhere, the amount of time you're somewhere changes the location of that business. 
I know of no jurisdiction that takes that into consideration in any way whatsoever. I don't even know how they'd measure it or consider it, right? Because those concepts aren't as solid as we like to think that they are. We tend to think that they are. So in a lot of these cases, you say, well, Scott's, you know, doing something in Nicaragua. Well, yes, I'm an American worker at an American company doing a job that happens in America to American clients. And I'm on vacation in Nicaragua. If I was here for a weekend, it would never, if I said I work from Nicaragua and I was only here for a weekend on vacation, you'd say you're not even a digital nomad. You're a guy out for the weekend, right? That's a ridiculous thing to say. If I was here for a week, you'd say the same thing. Well, you're taking a real vacation. Still a ridiculous thing to say. If I was here for a month, people would say that's not moving to Nicaragua. You're just on vacation. Just now it's a good one, right? There's no line where your vacation stops being a vacation. If you went back to the 1800s, 1700s, Brit, uh, uh, British, but European travelers would go on the grand tour of Europe for six months, 12 months at a shot away from their country. Did they move away? Did they stop being British or whatever? Did they suddenly, you no, know, they're just on a vacation. Back then travel was much slower. It had to take longer, but it's just, so that hasn't changed now. And having that perspective that you're on an indefinite vacation, you still have 100% access to your home country. You're still a worker potentially in your home country. You still have job potentials in your home country. You leverage them. Enjoy your vacation. Your vacation can be indefinite. It can stay forever. But that's an important perspective to have because it answers a lot of those things. You are not a citizen of Nicaragua. You will never become a citizen of Nicaragua. So you have to think of it as an indefinite traveler rather than being as a citizen who lives there, nor are you on a path to citizenship. All those immigrants who move to the US are at least on a path towards citizenship. Many of them will never achieve it. Some of them decide to leave before they get it, but the idea that they're on that path, that it's an option, that they're working towards it, they're on a funnel in that way. And in Nicaragua, you are not, is two different mechanisms. And so that's a very important viewpoint to have on that. All right, ask those questions, like, and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. If anyone's still hanging out, this has been super long. I really appreciate everyone joining for this. I do think it's a super important topic. Thank you so much for the question and the follow-ups and, and let me know what parts are still being missed on this. And give, give you know, let's dig into real business examples. What do you actually want to do? Um, and and you know, what skill set do you have? What, why is it you don't want to work online? Why do you not want a high paying, uh, skilled job in the US or Canada, something in line with Nicaragua, where you can stay at home and live an, an incredibly affluent life here in Nicaragua um, and bring in money and be, be super great for the country? What's making you really want to work, not just invest, invest, great, but what makes you want to be a worker in Nicaragua and, and be out in the heat and, and get the low pay and have to pay the taxes. What's pushing you to do that when you could make so much more and have so much more flexibility and, and, and provide so much more to Nicaragua um, in, in an alternative way? So get down, let me know. I will see all of you tomorrow. And we're going to pop up on the screen some extra videos. I know you're tired. Please just let it run in the background or something. Show some love to the channel. Uh, go check out uh, Generic Expats and Immense Coffee Movement. Both did interviews with me today. Go check those out on those channels. See you tomorrow.